and welcome everybody yet again to another YouTube lecture. This is lecture number four. We're still in period two. I believe this will be the last video that will deal with this period. Uh, starting next week, we'll be moving into period three. Uh, this one, I wanted you to kind of understand about the imperial slave economy that is now going to develop here in the colonies and how it basically came about. So again, we're in the same big picture question that we've been in now for a couple of weeks. And by now, this should you should really know what this big picture question is. Um, again, how they're developing these distinct these distinctive colonial and native societies, and we've talked a lot about that in class, and obviously on these videos as well. Ooh, look at that! Awesome. And here are these three key concepts still that we're in. Uh, concept two point one, two point two, two point three. Remember that that refers to the fact that this is period two, key concept one, period two, key concept two, and uh, all right, so just making sure you remember that. We're gonna be looking here on this video, key concept three again. All right, we've done this a lot in class and on some of the videos. Here we're specifically looking again at this Atlantic commercial world. All right, in class we've talked about the religious aspects, uh, some of the political aspects, but really, right now, we want to look at the commercial world that's growing and how slavery, especially, is part of this. Uh, you can see down here uh, the growth of an Atlantic economy throughout the 18th century created a shared labor market and a wide exchange of New World and European goods, as seen in the African slave trade. All right, this becomes a very important aspect for early colonial America. In creating their uh, trade economies. Slavery becomes a major part of this. Now, I want you to make sure you understand something. It is Spain and Portugal that start the slave economy. They're the ones that first controlled it, and I'll have that on a slide here in a little bit as well. And then England slowly takes it over as England starts to rise as a commercial power as well as a naval military power. They'll eventually inherit this system that the Spanish and the Portuguese had already started. Ooh, here we go. So here is a picture representation. We're talking about this Atlantic slave trade. Uh, you've got uh, along the uh, coast here of Africa, you have powerful African nations that are constantly warring with each other. And for centuries, Africans have conquered other Africans and have enslaved them. This was nothing new. This was a part of their society. Uh, if you go back thousands of years ago into Europe, uh, you know the ancient Greeks enslaved people, the ancient Romans enslaved people. Slavery is something that has existed on the planet since men have been building systems for themselves. Uh, Asia has slavery. Uh, even in Native America, you know, you would see aspects of slavery even there before Europeans even came over. What happens is the Spanish and the Portuguese decide to take advantage of this once they start to trade with Africans because as they develop their colonies in the West Indies and in Central and South America, they're going to rely on slavery as a major part of their labor force. Look at this, 42%, 42% of your African slaves are going to wind up in the West Indies. The major driving force of this is the sugar plantations that are developed. Sugar will run the Atlantic system for decades upon decades into centuries. Sugar becomes the cash crop of the world, right, of the world. It is a major, major money player, sugar is. And this is eventually why England is going to take it over, because it's too much money uh, and it, there's too much opportunity here. Now notice, only 4% of African slaves come to British North America. Because there's not, what you're going to have here are your tobacco, eventually tobacco is Virginia, Maryland primarily. The Carolinas will have rice and indigo, but we're not going to use those as major world cash crops like the sugar industry will be. All right, that's, that's one of the big reasons for that. Slavery will be introduced into the Carolinas first because of rice. Um, one of the things that uh, that made slavery a little bit more, what's the word I want to say? I don't say profitable. That's not the word I'm looking for. 
but uh, viable perhaps. Uh, in the Carolinas, a lot of water, a lot of rivers and lakes and swamp area, which bred a lot of mosquitoes, which spread malaria. And it turns out that Africans uh, have a natural sort of defense mechanism to malaria, which is also a disease for them, sickle cell. And unfortunately, uh, Europeans will take advantage of this and sometimes use this as a reason uh, to justify their slavery. Now what happens is the, the European powers will actually trade for slaves. Europeans, generally speaking, do not go into Africa and hunt for slaves. They actually trade along the coast with powerful African nations and they trade in such things as uh, gold, uh, guns, a lot of guns are going to be traded because uh, the, the bigger African nations are going to want the guns. Uh, they'll trade in food stock. You know, any kind of commodity that the Africans themselves would like to have is what will be traded. And then once Africans are then loaded onto these ships, this now becomes what is known as the most dangerous moment. It's called the Middle Passage, and it is quite quite literally barbaric as to what's going to happen. Uh, here's a little relief showing of what this was like, taking men and women and literally piling them on top of one another. Just piling in as many humans as you can, treating them just completely horrible. Here, you're, you're chained, you're, you're locked in, and your textbook will actually use some pretty graphic things here. I mean, you're going to be sailing here for weeks in this type of position. The human body has got to take care of itself, and uh, it's going to create some very, very nasty situations. Uh, later on, especially uh, England, later on in the 1700s, will eventually outlaw the slave trade, but it won't stop slavers from coming over here and getting Africans, which will lead to some very cruel moments because you didn't want to be caught with slaves on your ship. So oftentimes they would take whole cargoes like this and throw them all into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the Middle Passage is, is the most dangerous situation ever, and it's one of the most barbaric uh, moments where man's injury to man is just unbelievable here. Um, but they wind up normally in the West Indies, and after a while, Americans will come to the West Indies, and that's in the beginning where they will purchase and trade for their slaves will be in the West Indies to bring back to the Americas. Some other things I want you to know and pay attention to is this South Atlantic system now that, um, that the colonies, the American colonies, the British colonies, I should actually say at this point, um, it's an agricultural commercial system for them. Right? Uh, you have England is starting to take over the sugar plantations in West Indies. Uh, again, tobacco, rice, uh, indigo, these things are very important on the American uh, co uh, continent itself. So it is an agricultural commercial system for them. And it's the way that they made money. And slaves became something that after a while, once indentured servants, it became obvious that this wouldn't work as well for them. Slavery became the cornerstone, if you will, to their system. Uh, it was centered in Brazil and the West Indies. And again, sugar is what drove this system. A lot of money to be made in sugar. And I mentioned in class, one of the things that, uh, and I'll talk about this in the next slide, uh, New England colonies, although not really having a lot of slaves there, they will have a few, but not like we'll be in the South. But sugar became very important to them as well because they can take sugar and turn it into molasses and then from molasses turn it into rum. And rum became a major money maker in the world. This all fell under the mercantilist system that we talked about in class. You know, they're, they're producing all of this and they're selling it to British companies in order to make money. But the, the big chunk of change is going to go to the English government under mercantilism. And again, as I mentioned earlier, make sure you do know this, that Spain and Portugal are the ones who started this system and gradually England will take over. And slavery begins to transform then the colonies. Uh, Virginia and South Carolina, a little bit different for them with slaves. Uh, in honesty, Virginia treated their slaves much kinder, if you will, than they did in South Carolina. South Carolina has a little bit more harsher conditions. Uh, but However, in growing rice and growing tobacco, it's not as extremely intensive as it is sugar. 
turns out that sugar plantations, you're in the very, very hot uh, tropical conditions. It is extremely labor uh, in, uh, situation and very, very dangerous. And a lot of slaves will die in the West Indies. Whereas tobacco in Virginia and later on rice in the Carolinas, uh, although it is, it is labor intensive, it's not nearly the type of work that you'd have to do when in, um, when in the West Indies. So the, the conditions here in the Americas were a little bit kinder than for slavery than it was in the West Indies. And uh, I want you to take a look in your textbook as well and start to see how uh, an African identity will eventually emerge here in the Americas. Uh, they'll bring over some of their own customs, <laughs> their religion. As they're being Christianized in America, they will fuse this with a lot of their African customs and African traditions and create their own form of Christianity here. Uh, they'll start to create their own like sub-societies within the Southern society uh, as they're here. And, and over, again, the decades and the decades turn into centuries. An entire different type of system for for Africans will develop here in the South. In the North, you have their maritime economy. <clears throat> Again, this means uh, maritime, the ocean. Uh, New England also becomes very much part of this slave system. They're the ones that's going to help supply sugar islands, for instance, with the bread, uh, with lumber, with fish, with meat. So this will stimulate the economies of New England, the various New England colonies. By 1700, you can obviously look and see that the economy of all those New England colonies are going to be completely interwoven with the West Indies. I'm just abbreviating here. That means West Indies and New England. The middle colonies especially will also be very important to this. They'll supply corn and wheat. And the middle colonies are basically New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Those four colonies are where much of our bread stock and corn will will be produced from, and they'll also be very much involved in this uh, slave economy that develops. And because, again, they're not dependent upon massive plantations in the north, so an ur <coughs> excuse me, an urban economy is going to develop here. Cities will grow faster in the north than they will in the south. Philadelphia becomes a major port city. You've got New York is going to emerge. Boston's going to emerge. These are going to become major urban centers. Uh, we're going to have distilling of rum, later on whiskey, lumbering. And remember we talked about the Navigation Acts in class. Eventually the Navigation Acts begin to allow for shipbuilding in the Americas. Uh, a big reason for this is because the English began to realize it was more practical to actually build ships in the Americas than to try and ship it all to England and try to build their fleet there. So Americans took a huge advantage of the Navigation Acts for this. And remember, we talked about how Americans were really, really good at smuggling because the Navigation Acts allowed them to build their own ships. This will really help them in trading all along the American coast, into the West Indies, into South America, Central America. Um, so they took advantage of this. And this, again, will help build their urban economies. A lot of German immigrants are coming to America. They're attracted by all the jobs that are going to be created here. Again, because of this uh, imperial slave economy that's developing. Uh, these Germans will mostly go to Philadelphia. Some will also go to New York. Uh, there's a lot of jobs to be had. Uh, and country folk from the countryside uh, will also be attracted to go to the cities. Smaller vessels will be built. They'll, sell up and, they'll sail up and down the Hudson and Delaware rivers uh, where they're going to be able to bring European goods into America. They'll also be able to pick up the barrels of flour and wheat and whatever else is being produced. They'll be taken back to the West Indies. So all along these rivers, you're going to have smaller towns are going to emerge. And that's going to create taverns, let's say restaurants. It's going to create uh, what we would call today like hotels, but let their, their inns, places where people could sleep. Uh, all types of little businesses are going to start to emerge all up and down the Hudson and Delaware and some other rivers. So it really starts to stimulate an economy here in America. Now, I love this painting. Isn't this just an awesome painting? Uh, this is the... William Penn's Treaty with the Indians. 
It's depicting, uh, depicting an event that took place in 1683. It was painted, though, in 1771 and completed in 1772 by a, a famous American artist, Benjamin West. Benjamin West, one of the first true American artists, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, the American artist later on, um, but I want to talk a little bit about Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a very different type uh, of a colony. It's, it's a colony that is named after one particular person, William Penn. Pennsylvania literally translates to Penn's Woods. Uh, this here in the center would be William Penn, and maybe you recognize this style of hat. If you've ever had a, a, a box of Quaker Oats in your house, and you see the Quaker Oats man, those are the brim hats, large brim hats of the Quakers. Quakers is a religious sect of Christianity. It's a nickname. Their actual name of their religion is the Society of Friends. Uh, extreme pacifists are the, are the Quakers. They really don't believe in war. Uh, and when William Penn's father had helped out the government uh, during the, um, the Civil War, the English Civil War, and later on the Restoration period. So the government had owed William Penn's father for this, but he had passed away. So in turn, the king paid off his debt to the Penn family by giving Pennsylvania to William Penn. And it's the king who actually named Pennsylvania so that anyone could look at a map in America and see that name, Pennsylvania, and everybody would know that the king pays off his debts. Now, this was a Quaker experiment. The Quakers believe in, in tolerance. Uh, they believe in all groups of people should come, a lot, come together. Uh, they, they, they accepted all religions in Pennsylvania. And a merchant class, these are not Quakers. In fact, this is what this painting is supposed to represent. Three different groups that came together in Pennsylvania. The founders are the Quakers. The merchants are the ones who came, uh, non-Quakers, but came and took advantage of this very tolerant society, and the Indians. Right? The Quakers got along very well with the Indians. They accepted Indian and Indian culture. Uh, the main uh, Indian protagonist in this painting is an Indian. Um, it, you perhaps pronounce his name Tam Anin, Taminin, or perhaps Tam Ma -in. But over the years, Tammany became the, the traditional way of saying it, Tammany. Uh, he's the leader of a group of Indians known as the, uh, Lan, uh, the Lanape Indians, later on called Delaware Indians. So we'll just call them the Delaware Indians because that's the easiest way to say it. And it's interesting that Tammany, this Indian chief, will become very famous in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a lot of peace that will happen between the settlers of, of Pennsylvania and the Indians. But unfortunately, for some strange reason, his name, Tammany, eventually becomes synonymous with political corruption in New York. If you know anything about New York City, their city hall is named Tammany Hall after this Indian. And it became the center of, of massive political corruption. And over time, I'll, I'll explain that and I'll go back to you. But I just think this is a beautiful painting, uh, very, very very much almost like a renaissance type kind of a deal, but but it shows that a, a, here in America, some culture is starting to come. We're starting to get some Americans who want to become artists. And uh, again, it's a good way to introduce to you some of the uh, aspects of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania becomes the dairy and wheat uh, colony, especially wheat, uh, bread. Sometimes we call this the bread basket of America. All right. So for some further reading, again, go to your textbook, pages 81 through 84. I should put on here also page 76 is where you get to read about Pennsylvania and the Quakers. Um, but here in 81 through 84, it gives you a little bit more information about this imperial slave trade and the Middle Passage. 86 through 93, we get to hear about slavery in the Chesapeake and South Carolina. Oh, look at that. I didn't tell you what. 94 and 96 is the, uh, is the maritime economy in New England. All right. Well, thank you for your patience and watching my video, and we'll see you later in class. Bye-bye.